the foundation document states that one of the foundation's members who was a director in 2016 phoned a senior staff member of the foundation to say that the real donor was not the same donor as on the tax receipt. Uh, who was that former director and current foundation member who contacted the staff members reported in La Presse? Do you know? Uh, yes, I do know. You talked about Mr. Johnson and that he's been there since the beginning. And according to you, what do you believe his ties are with the Trudeau family? You freeze the money, essentially. You don't use it because you're not comfortable with a foreign entity using your organization's name to further foreign interests through academic conferences and the like. Is that correct? So a reasonable person looking at this could suggest that a $200,000 donation to the Trudeau Foundation for the purposes of furthering Chinese interests in, in Canadian academic spaces could be either interference or influence. Would that, would that be fair to say? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious. They, they came to your house. Is that customary? Um, I don't know if it is custom, but what they, uh, what they mentioned is that because they were paying for my phone, my computer, and my internet, uh, so they were at my house from 6 o'clock until 12 at night. This is your wake-up call. <laughs> this guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Uh, we know from the agreement that there were two so-called donors, purported donors, two individuals. Uh, we know uh, based upon uh, the tax receipt that had been issued that there had been a company, the Millennium Golden Eagle International Canada, that had been listed. Is that correct? On the, on the receipt, yeah. The receipt, yes. And you had cited that there was the China Cultural Industry Association mm -hmm. that had been corresponding with uh, staff at the Trudeau Foundation. Uh, do you believe that the source of the donation was the China Cultural Industry Association? The true source? That's why I wanted to have an audit, right, uh, and a forensic audit with everything regarding that foundation and the uh, legal advice that I that I uh, received. Again, I want to mention that at the time when we gave back the money with the executive committee of the board and those who were there at the time who signed the check, I did not sign the check myself, signed the check to give back the money. Um, in, from that moment and in the weeks after I started to, to read some of these emails, I had no idea about these emails, okay. um, and I... I immediately uh, asked for help from lawyers, and the advice that I did receive was do not give back now. Now that the money was sent back to the foundation, don't give it back now, because we need to understand everything around that donation. So it's not a good idea to send it back. You should just freeze everything, don't touch it, and we're going to ask all of these questions. We'll, we will uh, look at the emails at the time, we'll meet witnesses, we'll talk to some of the board members, some of the members, possibly former employees. Employees, we'll try to understand what happened with that donation. I cannot answer your question. I was not even there. That's why I wanted to have a now, forensic audit. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Madam Fournier. La Presse reported that a found doc the foundation document states that one of the foundation's members, who was a director in 2016, phoned a senior staff member of the foundation to say that the real donor was not the same donor as on the tax receipt. Uh, who was that? former director and current foundation member who contacted the staff members reported in La Presse. Do you know? Uh, yes, I do know. And who is that? Um, so her name is Farah Mohammed. Uh, so she she's a, a member currently not on the board uh, and um, was uh, on the executive committee, was on the board at the time. Um, and in the emails uh, that, that, w that are part of you know, the file and the server now at the foundation, uh, she, was wa she was in these emails of, of uh, you know, that contract itself and so on. And um, um, I, I have no information regarding these donors. I mean, I was not even there at the Who did time. did she say was the donor? Who did she, she did not say. She did not say. To? Who is the donor? Okay. 
Okay. Um, upon your review of uh, the various emails uh, between the foundation and the uh, uh, donation, uh, were there cor was there correspondence either to or from uh, officials in the PMO? Can you repeat your question? Upon your review of the emails, mm -hmm. did you identify any emails between the foundation and officials in the PMO, the Prime Minister's office? Um, I don't have anything with me now, but I vaguely remember um, some emails with the PMO uh, and Elise Cantois, who was the executive director, uh, I have I don't have anything with me, but I, I believe it was like emails regarding you know the kind of press release because there were articles in the newspaper in 2016 about the Chinese donation. Uh, I don't I don't remember precisely. And there were emails from 2016. Can you elaborate on what those emails were? You. you what, what, what was, why was the PMO suddenly contacting the Trudeau Foundation about this donation? I have no idea. You have no idea. And were, was there, were there other emails that you noted other than in 2016 between Foundation and the PMO? I have not seen other emails. I um, Immediately with the CFO, uh, we immediately reached out to the board with emergency meetings and said, we don't want to look into this matter. We want experts to look into these emails and to understand and reconstitute the past. So I, I don't have more uh, information okay. regarding. Okay. On March 1st, you issued a statement uh, in which you stated that the foundation had refunded to the donor all amounts received. Those were the precise words in that statement. Of course, uh, the money had not been refunded to the donor. Uh, did, who, who was involved in drafting that statement, and why was it stated that uh, the money had been uh, sent back to the donor when, in fact, that had not happened. I need a, a very, very quick response, please. Yes. So it was the executive committee of the board of director. The two individuals who signed the check are Peter Salas and Bruce McNiven with their own signature. Uh, and the drafting of the declaration was done with the executive committee of the board. So Peter Salas, Bruce McNiven, Ted Johnson, Marta Durden, and Zian Adam. Uh, we drafted that declaration together with some help from on the communication side. Uh, and it was accurate that we was we were actually on that day issuing a check signed by Bruce McDevin and Peter Salas physically sent to the address that we had on file. So there was nothing incorrect about that. That was March 1st. Uh, the check came back. So they went three times. So they were, there was about two weeks uh, until uh, the check was finally uh, sent Mr. Mr. Back Cooper, to I'm going to ask you to pick this up in the next round of questioning, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Fournier, you mentioned early on in your testimony that there were Chinese directives that the foundation received. Can you tell us more who was receiving what and what was your impression? The emails came from that Chinese association that was sending emails to foundation employees stating what needed to be on the receipts, what names needed to be there or not, what addresses. And so a lot of emails back and forth between employees and that Chinese-based association. And there was an absence of the donors. They were not part of the emails, but the association was saying, or some emails were saying, the donors, thank you, but there was no direct link that I could see between the donors and the foundation. So the link was between that association and the foundation. So it was, it seemed almost to be by a third party. There was about 160 pages requested by the Global Ma Globe and Mail 
as an access to information request in 2017. So 160 pages were sent to the Globe and Mail in 2017, which included almost everything, the contracts, uh, employee emails, the copy of tax receipts. This is something that I found out at the beginning of March. But that access to information request was important. And everything was shown. So everything that was in the books. Is this a usual request from donors? No. We have a policy for accepting donations and I had this adopted at the foundation and so while I was there I worked with lawyers to find out who the donor was what the intentions were and I did an in-depth analysis of donors before s signing anything and this is something that was being done since 2018 with fellows and mentors so that we could have a healthy uh, governance that was irreproachable. But before I arrived, and what I could, from what I could see in the books, there was no verification done on donors or on the contract. Was it examined by lawyers from what I could understand with my CFO that wasn't done you talked about donations having different policies for over or under a million it fluctuates but often we receive smaller donations usually it's people who went through the foundation who will make donations of hundreds of dollars, but large donations are infrequent. Do you often receive donations from countries that don't have links with the foundation? It's the only one to my knowledge. You mentioned tensions in your office just before you stepped down. One of the reasons was that you were asking people to recuse themselves, which I believe is completely normal, and I imagine that they did not want to recuse themselves. Indeed, who were these people? Ted Johnson from the board, and he was the chair for auditing at the time, financial auditing, so he would sign letters with the CEO, so with Morris Rosenberg, to state that there was no fraud to their knowledge, and he was chair of different committees. Bruce McNevin, who is treasurer currently at that time, he was also a part of the financial auditing committee. Peter Salas, who was a member of the Financial Audit Committee from 2017 on. And so the request had to do, for me and the eight members who left, is that people who were, at, who were there at the time recuse themselves. So it was those three people that I named. We asked them to self-identify and say, yes, I was there at the time, I will recuse myself. And, I, and they were going to recuse themselves from the contract so that they wouldn't have an impact on how it was going to happen. To my legal knowledge, it was reasonable. We haven't heard from Edward Johnson Edward Johnson is a founding member like Bruce McNevin. So they were there at the very beginning of the foundation. There were members at the beginning, and one of their roles was to name the board. I told you that we could have up to 30 members, so that's quite a lot. So 
a governance structure of up to 50 people with 10 employees. It's a very small team for such a significant governance. And there were a lot of committees at the time as well. Mr. Johnson had worked with Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He was his executive assistant and was a founding member. And when I stepped down, he was president of a, the governance committee, the executive committee, a member of the board, and he sat on the finance and investments, investment committee. So he knows the governance structure very well because he's been there for 20 years. On that note, according to the registered charity information returned for September 1st, 2017 to August 31st, 2018, the total eligible amount of all gifts for which the charity issued tax receipts was $25,374. Given that the donation of $200,000 or um, 140 actually received occurred in 2016, would that year be an outlier in terms of donations the foundation received? Um, J'ai pas bien compris. Là, vous prenez l'année la, la, 2017 à 2018. Is that correct? 2017, 2018. 2017, 2018. 25,000 dollars. The following year. Um, écoutez, je, je, je peux pas me prononcer. I cannot uh, talk about the books before my arrival. But I could mention that the donations to the foundation, well, the, the foundation had not major uh, fundraising uh, activities. We were living with the interest from uh, the endowment to create programs for fellows, and we wanted to in the last couple of years, we were getting ready to do some fundraising, but it was never a main activity of the foundation. Uh, you know, this is an endowment. Uh, I think it was about a $6 million operating budget currently, $156 million. Is that correct? So $6 million for fellows, for uh, board-directed programs and yet we have a $200,000 endowment that seems to be conditional from um, you know an unverified third party source potentially foreign um, so in, in your work were there any other donor directed funds just a simple yes or yes or no if there were other donors what was your question again donor I'm sorry, I directed hear well. donor directed funds um no on a uh and so he said, no, we had individual donors, as I said, former, uh, we had matching grant, for example. So this was the only donor-directed conditional uh, a donation that was provided. In your time, so you brought in a little bit of due diligence through the governance structure to ensure that donors were, were vetted, that you had a proper uh, board risk analysis. I myself have spent some time on a, on a pretty um, a solid historical board here in Hamilton, and I know that we had lots of policies, eyes wide open for every donor, uh, and yet it didn't exist before you got there. So I'm just wondering, like, in your opinion, if you had been receiving twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year in donations, and then you received a two hundred thousand dollar donation, uh, you would your testimony is that you would embark on an investigation as to the origins of the donor, correct? Well, there was a policy on the acceptance of gifts in 2016. There was a policy on acceptance of gifts in. But the policy at the time uh, mentioned that uh, the president of the foundation had to obtain legal advice with regard to the contract itself and the origin of the donors. So there was a policy. We made it, uh, we made it to the next level, if I can say, and we also adopted in 2018 a policy on responsible investment, which I'm really sure. proud of. But there was a policy in place uh, okay. that required that this kind of background be so with, with more specificity, this is not a traditional foundation. This is a foundation named after a former prime minister whose son is the current prime minister. 
from a governance standpoint uh, to ensure that you are beyond reproach, what special policies are uh, implemented within the board level governance to ensure that there's no perception of foreign interference or foreign influence, i.e., you know, the, the use of the name for purposes that might provide a foreign interest. Did you have any consideration around that in your risk analysis? Well, or under my leadership, what I would do uh, was to conduct that kind of in-depth research, not myself. Again, I'm a firm believer in independence of the process. So I had a law firm who would conduct, come back to me with what they found, and then I would go back to the development committee and then back to the board uh, to say, this is, I will go ahead with that donation. This is the risk analysis that was conducted. Uh, I was conscious of the name and the perception that individuals might have uh, regarding the name, and I was exceptionally careful careful uh, with regard to donations. I cannot and, comment and course, on the past, obviously, but sure. I can tell you that there was a policy in place. But you would also have to have that consideration given that the Prime Minister's brother was an active member of the board as well, understanding our conflict of interest uh, rules and code of ethics within Parliament, correct? Yes, it, 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 okay. it is correct. So, um, you know, you freeze the money Essentially, you don't use it because you're not comfortable with a foreign entity using your organization's name to further foreign interests through academic conferences and the like. Is that correct? Um, we did not touch the money because the only way to touch the money was to organize the lectures around China, which had nothing to do with my mandate. So I had adopted a brand new strategic plan. We were going was it the to mandate before you were there? We were not going to China and we were not doing anything with regard Sorry, to I'm China. Like, uh, did, was it part of the, the previous uh, mandate when you took on the organization? Did you see within the mandate no. the board governance? So this was brand new? Yeah. Okay. So a reasonable person looking at this could suggest that a $200,000 donation to the Trudeau Foundation for the purposes of furthering Chinese interests in, in Canadian academic spaces could be either interference or influence. Would that, would that be fair to say? Well, I... Uh, I'm if, if I may just answer very quickly, very quickly the, the Pierre Yotrou Foundation is about academic knowledge. So one of the key themes is Canada and the world. So we could imagine having, you know, conferences around China, Brazil, Brussels, you know, this, it, it could be done in an academic milieu. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, the problem to me was, you know, what was done in terms of the background check regarding these donors. And I had many questions and I wanted the law firm to help me. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fournier, I'm curious, if you were to point us to those who have the most um, pertinent voices with regards to this matter, who are the most important people that we should be hearing from at this committee? Great question. Um, the vice chair of the board of director who has resigned, Zian Ada, a former uh, language uh, commissioner here uh, for 10 years, um, she was asked to actually become the chair uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, was approached by our lawyers and they asked her, you know, given the fact that the current chair was there at the time and was actually the chair of the audit committee, uh, it would be good for you to become the chair of how to, an to handle that uh, uh, that, that matters. So I think it would be very important to hear from her, given the fact that the lawyers contacted her and had asked her to take a proactive role, uh, Diane Adam. Um, I would uh, also mention uh, the board members who have resigned uh, together on that day. I think it would be very important for you to hear from them, uh, given the fact that we had an emergency meeting on March 31st uh, and they resigned 10 days later. So to hear from them, to hear from them about the motion that they circulated uh, and how it went in their opinion. Okay. Um, earlier you said that uh, you had items that were taken from you is the word that you used. Um, I, I'm wondering when that happened. When, when were the items that you were using uh, in, your, in your role as CEO, when were they taken from you? So I resigned on Monday, uh, April 10th, uh, and on the day, it was the end of the day, uh, when I uh, resigned, I uh, uh, sent a letter uh, to the board members and to the members, uh, and on that day, immediately, uh, they shut down my, my email access uh, so that I 
couldn't reach out to the scholars, fellows, and mentors to uh, explain to them that I that I was resigning. Uh, I uh, so that's the first aspect. Uh, and the um, the day after, I if I remember correctly, it was the day after, or I'm pretty sure it was the day after uh, the foundation um, asked the. Uh, the IT individual to come to my house uh, to uh, take uh, my my computer, my iPhone, the internet access that I had. Um, so I bought a new you know phone and and computer and so on. But they uh, and they asked me not to keep any documentation, anything that I had um, access to. So in order for me to come to you today, I had almost nothing. Uh, I have annual reports that are public. I have some. Uh, documents that are of a public nature. I did ask for a few emails uh, from individuals who had received them, if they could send it to me so that at least I could speak to you today. But I do not have all of the information uh, that I had at the time, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, they, they came to your house. Is that customary? Um, I don't know if it is custom, but what they uh, what they mention is that because they were paying for my phone, my computer, and my internet, uh, so they were at my house from six o'clock until twelve at night, twelve thirty, uh, to uh, make sure that they would leave with with everything, uh, uh, any possible you know access to uh, to computers, iPhones, uh, and internet, and so on. Um, they insisted on the fact that they wanted to read all of the text messages uh, and that I was not allowed to touch any of the text messages. Um, and so I, um, I did collaborate and, and obviously uh, gave back um, everything that, uh, that I had. So you will understand that I don't have access to uh, Almost nothing. I remember a lot from uh, memory, uh, but I had some individuals who sent back some emails so that I could testify today. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to touch base on, on the donation being returned. You said that a check was written and that a check was delivered. Was a check cashed? No. So the check that was sent uh, had to be actually received physically from the donors themselves, right? So that's how it works. So you send something and you cannot just give the check to anybody. So the donors themselves were not there from March 1st until March 3rd. Uh, 23rd, so they attempted several times to go and find the donors so that they could take the check and check and uh, really uh, uh, take the money, and they could not find them. So to this day, it hasn't actually been returned. Um, well, what happened when it was returned, I did receive legal advice not to give back the money and actually to have that forensic audit, unrestricted forensic audit, to understand everything regarding that donation you know, with the possibility that the donors are not themselves the, do the real donors, you know, all of that, all of that had to be uh, uh, understood with experts, so I did find the experts. Merci, um, uh, Madame Fournier. Thank you. You talked about Mr. Johnson and that he's been there since the beginning. And according to you, what do you believe his ties are with the Trudeau family? Mr. Johnson worked for Pierre Elliott Trudeau as executive assistant and so he knows the children, Alexandre, Justin. He's known them since they were children and stayed close to the family. He has a great affection for the Trudeau family. And so I know that when they were children, he would go canoeing with them. He told me stories and that there was trust that was built over the years. Apologies for interrupting you. Would you say that, and I'll take this, the expression, would he risk his life to protect them? Would he take a bullet for them? I enjoyed working with him, and I wasn't present during times where he was close to the family, but I do know that he is. And you mentioned that when you arrived, there were almost no employees. And the board was renewed around 2017. A lot of people left. Why did they leave? I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly. 
I know that it was very heated when Mr. Rosenberg left and a lot of board members left at that same time. And there was a person who was named by the board in order to be in crisis management for about nine months. And so some were forced to leave and there were almost no employees when I arrived. Isabelle Udon, for example, who is somebody who is close to Justin Trudeau, who stepped down. I don't think she was part of the board at the time, but she was a guest. I thought I saw that in the annual report. She was a guest at one of our conferences, but I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe she was there at the time. In 2018, at the beginning of my mandate, I knew that I wanted to travel through Canada and I wanted us to focus on diversity of members, of fellows and mentors. I wanted us to represent Canada, have a regional race and gender diversity, and we wanted people in the board who would represent diversity at all levels in Canada. So in 2018, we had an impressive arrival of very diverse people, and these are the same people who left on April 10th with me. Thank you. I do want to pick up on something that Mr. Vilmuir said, uh, Madame Fournier, before I go to Mr. Green. Was Mr. Rosenberg fired from the foundation for his role in the donation? I was not there at the time, and I cannot answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to go back to kind of your early analysis of the donation. You would have been seized with it. Obviously, you took great steps in your leadership role. In your estimation, what was the relationship between Mr. Zhang Bing and the government of the People's Republic of China? Well, I... Um what I did uh, notice was that he was the chair of the board of that uh, association uh, based uh, in China. So he, that association was in relationship to, with the government. He was the chair of that association, uh, and he uh, was one of the of the donors. Uh, that's all I have in terms of it. I don't have more information than that. Is it fair to say that the association was an extension of the People's Republic of China, of the government? Um, I, I think the proximity, uh, there was a, a very strong proximity. Uh, I don't know if I would say extension, uh, but it was clearly under the guidance, uh, I think was the expression used on their website, under the guidance of, uh, of the government. And the association was the one providing the direction on the details of the donation, is that correct? The same correct. association? Correct, yes. And so one could infer then, through that line of reasoning, that there would have been guidance from the People's Republic of China on dealing with the matters related to this particular donation? Possibly. That's why I wanted to have an unrestricted forensic audit to understand what happened before I became president and CEO of the foundation. Is there anything that you would have done differently, knowing what you know now? Um, yes. I, at the time when we gave back you know, the money to the donors, uh, I was under the impression uh, that there was not this relationship with the, the government of, of China or that association and all of these emails. Um, the check that we sent back was signed by the two board members, Peter Salas and Bruce McNiven. I did believe this was the right course of action at the time. It is later on that I found out about uh, these um, uh, different emails. And the more that I did research, the more I wanted to do an investigation and not to touch the money anymore and to have that unrestricted forensic audit was Five very seconds, important Mr. to me. Ms. Ms. Fournier, I want to give you the opportunity subsequent to this meeting. Uh, there's going to be further testimony. There's probably going to be some um, responses to the statements that that you've made. I want to invite you to have under parliamentary privilege the opportunity to reply to this committee in writing should you feel that you are being maligned or misrepresented in any ways. I just wanted to extend that invitation to you.
appreciate what you uh, mentioned right now because uh, it is, uh, I did not ask to come to testify. I do it out of good faith and I believe in transparency and in democracy. Uh, but I really did make sure that nothing I was saying to you today could be used against me and that this uh, uh, privilege uh, is not just in theory, but that in practice I don't receive any intimidation uh, or attempts to attack my reputation. I want to mention that I was just renewed for two more years with an impeccable record at the pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. So I surely hope that there's not an attempt to try uh, to uh, say something else uh, about me. I, uh, my entire career has been built around my reputation of integrity and transparency. Okay.